They have been working on an edit button for a year. Well, it's a hard, it's a tricky situation. Edit's incredibly complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good one, indeed. I mean, we don't even have uh, a, 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 an app that's as good as WeChat in China. Uh, and like in China, you can like live on WeChat, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, everyone, everyone's like, they're like, you live on WeChat, you do payments, you do everything. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Basically, WeChat's case. Um, and we don't have anything like WeChat outside of China. So I was like, my idea would be like, how about if we just copy WeChat? Hey. Really? <laughs> copy them. Buys Twitter, copies WeChat. Yeah, pretty Pop. much. <laughs> yes. I mean, a little bit like, well, Alipay is just embedding in New York City taxis as a, you know, addressing the, the tourists. Alipay has grand ambitions in the United States. I, I agree 100% with Dan that, you know, each market has its unique... Do they admit that? But, I'm not sure they admit that, but you think that that's... I, I, they, uh, they eventually want to be a big player in payments I here. think there's no doubt about that. What makes you say that? I, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know Dan and I both have had conversations with people at the, both those companies, and I think you know this is a large economy. They want growth. They they think about. I mean, Alipay in particular has been incredibly strategic about you know making investments and then stitching together. You know, they're the largest shareholder in Paytm. They're the largest shareholder in uh, I can't remember the payment network in Indonesia. And yeah, you know, they're in some ways they're building their own version of an interoperable payment right. network, but close to their their world. Yeah extrapolate the Chinese experience to other markets. But you have to remember, like, it, they came from a completely different place. First of all, they did not have an embedded point of sale uh, system in place. So very few of the merchants accepted credit cards. They didn't have really a, a, a large credit uh, system in place. And so QR codes came naturally. They, the Chinese market uh, it's probably the most developed market in the world around digital payments, to your point. doesn't matter where you go. You really don't use cash. Like, you go into a, a lot of the stores. Like, things like shopping carts, like, they don't even know what that is because <laughs> they're just scanning and having it delivered. Yeah. You know, there's no checkout. There's uh, things like that. So... It's a very different environment, but they have density in their cities, and it's... I was thinking about uh, Andrew yeah. saying that he didn't have a tip, right, because he had no cash, but in yeah. China, right, they all just pull out their phone and give you their QR codes. And by the way, that's a exiting. simple and easy thing for us to do in this country, too. QR codes is a really easy thing to do for tipping, for very small businesses, but we have an entrenched point of sale system here. It's going to be very different in the U.S. than China. And stable coins are kind of a potential connector between the crypto world and the real world. Now, a stable coin is simply a crypto token that is supposed to be backed uh, by real assets, and, and most of them that we talk about are backed by dollars. So one token equals one dollar. They're only used for crypto trading today. They might have other applications. But they exist, and my concern is we're not addressing the risks. I think our regulators uh, often take the view that, well, it's better just to try to keep them out of the regulatory perimeter. Um, but I don't think that really works. And, you know, I think the competition from stablecoins could be useful, again, if we address the risks, and they are significant. Well, Tim, I've got to tell you, I, I remember during the bad days of 2008, where people broke the buck. We thought that there were securities backing up our dollar in our, in our money markets. And then we kind of cleared that up, and it was great. I know millions of investors, and, and just through my pan, you know, panoply of people I deal with, who, if they knew that there was something similar, a money fund that, that was crypto, they would feel so much more comfortable. Why isn't a Fidelity or a JP Morgan, which isn't really favoring this stuff, but, or even the SEC and Treasury just saying, here's what we want. Because then I could tell everybody, listen, it could be part of your 401k. It should be in your IRA. Well, I would take a slightly different approach, which is I've kind of viewed stable coins as a payment mechanism that wouldn't pay any interest. So I don't think people should regard them as, you know, an investment vehicle. The question is, would they be useful in payments? Now, you know, most of us think of the payment system and we think, well, that seems to be fine, right? I've got right. my credit cards. I've got mobile banking. Uh, what do we need anything else for? The truth is the U.S. system is slower and more expensive than what other countries have developed all over the world. And you see that particularly with cross-border payments 
And it also that burden falls heavily on the on lower income people because they don't have credit cards always or, you know, their checks don't get cleared by the bank quickly. So could stable coins help? Possibly. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the crypto, crypto teacher. teacher. And you know I come back with that video just to make you think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And guys, we have Jim Cramer pushing crypto. And this time, stable coins with former member of the CFTC. And guys, we know stable coins are nothing but digital dollars. But now they can be programmed. Telling you what, where, and when and how to buy and you have three to six months to spend them or poof, it's gone. So we definitely see CNBC pushing the agenda. And we have Elon Musk turning Twitter into X, his version of WeChat. And don't forget, guys, we had D interview Brad Garlinghouse and the CEO of PayPal. So she knew exactly the agenda that's going on. They wanted to set up the same system as China. But remember, guys, social credit, social shopping, social working, and they can cut you off in a second. And remember, the crypto teacher told you. He is now X, maybe Elon Musk rolling out that rebranding this morning, also announcing that X.com now redirects to the Twitter website. It's part of his long-held ambition to create an everything app that combines messaging, social networking, and payments. That is the focus of today's Tech Check. But the Jabosa D, I don't know if I see this sticking. Like, what are people going to say now? I'm, I'm going to spend time with my ex? <laughs> I was just thinking that. What do you say? I'm logging on to X. I'm going to send an X? What would be the verb of X? I, I actually have no idea. Um, but, you know, the idea of creating a super app is a wise one. I mean, many companies in Asia have done so, and they've been able to monetize and collect, you know, over a billion users, like in the case of Tencent's WeChat. But it's a lot harder here, John. You know this well. Are the way that the internet has developed and our payment systems make an idea like a super app more difficult? It's not as intuitive as it is in a place like Asia that doesn't have the legacy credit card and debit card systems that we do. So there is major question around whether Musk can actually succeed in doing this. But the idea of it is great. I mean, you have a walled garden. There's no reason for users to ever leave these apps. You can put user sellers and advertisers in one place. The algorithm is trained uh, a little better than having separate apps. I just don't know how likely it is, and that's obviously the biggest challenge that they'll have here. And it doesn't always work, right? I mean, Grab Super App hasn't exactly blown the doors off. Neither has Didi's effort to put together something like this. And then it, it seems like this conglomerate approach has happened through the ages. I mean, Yahoo, you know, had the, I forget what they called them at the time, it wasn't platform, but, you know, bringing all those things together. Google with all of, of the different apps, Facebook taking Instagram and Facebook and WhatsApp yeah. and Messenger and putting them together with payments. It's, just, it's been a user interface issue that maybe people over here just like apps that do a specific thing. Part of the reason all the companies that you mentioned, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, they all started on the desktop, right? So they were developed when companies were still building through a computer, through a PC, whereas the likes of WeChat, right, it grew in, an internet, in a mobile internet era. So they were able to be wider, whereas maybe the companies here, they were just more narrow, right? Facebook existed on your computer, so they're going to put it on a phone. So there wasn't as much opportunity. But I really think it's the payments that is the biggest sticking point. I think you could argue that Grab has succeeded more than anyone has here. Um, but it, because those payment system allowed them to, and also it's largely free. I mean, you have all kinds of fees here in the U.S. that don't really make a good incentive for the companies themselves to put it on a super app. I wonder if Elon ends up then competing with uh, Square, Jack Dorsey again, yeah. who, I mean, who knows how they feel about each other now, Apple and the banks. I mean, as if he doesn't have enough to do. If he can. You mentioned the inverted curve, and I've just been kind of obsessing over this um, for the last few hours, and of course this year we've all been watching that. Now, uh, the reason I've been thinking about it, Ed Yardeni um, thinks he has an explanation for the incredible inversion we've seen. I mean, three months, 10 year, over 100 basis points, 150 basis points, right? Um, and everyone's saying, does, does that mean a recession's coming? Or what, what is it signaling? Because the economy, the real economy data that we have looks very good. So Yardeni says, maybe the inversion of the yield curve just means that inflation is coming down at a rapid pace and not necessarily flagging a recession as it has the last you know, seven times. What's your take on that debate? 
so I, I think the inversion of the yield curve is a good indicator of recession, but it's been wrong. I think it's like it predicted nine of the last three recessions. I, I, I don't think it's a great – I don't think it is a great indicator. And you think about what's happening today. You used to have an economy that was very interest rate sensitive. The economy today is not interest rate sensitive. The companies that borrow for CapEx – or some, sorry, the companies that spend on CapEx today – you think about the big tech companies that are spending on AI or the Googles, Microsoft, the Apples. They don't really borrow. They use free cash flow. People have already locked in their mortgages at three, three and a half. So you don't have interest rate sensitivity there. The, the, the economy is just not. And you think about all the hiring in the economy, healthcare, education. These are not interest sensitive dynamics. So what happens is the Fed lifts the front end of the yield curve up, and you don't create that much of, of an impact. But like you say, inflation is coming down. So you create this inversion in an economy that's actually resistant to or less sensitive to interest rate hikes. And so it's not, I would argue, it's not a good indicator. At, at, at all. So the Fed, uh, which I always hated this term, uses the term data dependent. So with the extent it shows up in the data, which it is showing up in the data, it's why the service sector is this resilient, they're reacting. I'm a big fan at looking at drivers, and I think the Fed, I've encouraged them do more work at the ground level on this spending, not only what's been announced, but what's going to be announced because I think it'll give you a sense of what the data is like to look at six, 12 months from now. And this money will eventually run out, in which case I think your comments on the neutral rate, uh, I think the neutral rate isn't that high because we've got an aging society, decelerating workforce growth, productivity is okay, but not enough to make up for it. And you could have a situation where if this money dries up, when it does, it won't happen this year or next year, when it does dry up, I think you're going to have a much for more severe downturn, and the Fed's going to have to reverse course. Would you By the 340,000 Teamsters workers at UPS would create a more than $7 billion negative impact to the economy. That's according to estimates, and that's if the strike lasts 10 days, even more if longer. So you uh, uh, Government officials say, look at what they're doing. Um, I just gave a, I gave a talk at the Hudson Institute, a briefing a couple weeks ago, on how I believe she's preparing for war. If you just got, get out a whiteboard and write facts on a whiteboard, then I think that kind of strategy of bowing down or weakening rhetoric to not upset China uh, is the wrong path. I now, guys, we have BlackRock's Rick Reader on the yield curve. Says that is not a good indicator for recession, but then says the Fed manipulates the front end. And, guys, all you have to do is ask why. Why are they manipulate? So, therefore, they can hold things up. And guys, what do we always hear from Fed Jerome Powell? That's right, data dependent. And Kaplan expects the Federal Reserve to reverse in two years. But guys, we know we hear those drums are beating because we know they're ready to flip the switch in the emerging markets. The fourth industrial revolution they need to start rising. And we see CNBC playing the Hegelian dialectic. China is getting ready for war. It's time to cut China off. This is the biggest threat since Pearl Harbor. Guys, I thought we created Pearl Harbor. Oh, never mind. I forgot. Guys, we know the banks are the biggest what? I'll let you finish that. And remember the crypto teacher told you, but guys, you know, when it comes to the new world order, it's all planned out. You have a wonderful day. To even say that means you don't understand China. China only plays with a winner-take-all scenario. They've never played by the rules. They don't see us as a competitor. They see us as an enemy. This is the biggest threat we've had since Pearl Harbor. And just look at what they've done, the infiltration they've done in our country. They've bought 400,000 acres of U.S. soil, most recently near Grand Forks Air Force Base, where our most sensitive drone technology is. They bought the largest pork producer in the country. They have spy balloons going over us. But you look, they go and they spend millions of dollars in our universities to spread Chinese propaganda. They have Chinese front companies lobbying our Congress on behalf of the Communist Party. And then you look at the military, that what they're doing. Largest naval fleet in the world, 350 ships. They'll have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. And now they've become a big developer of neurostrike weapons which go and impair brain function. And they use that for military leaders, for, for major populations. They're developing hypersonic missiles. We've barely started. I mean, the list goes on in how much they're stealing $600 billion of intellectual property from us every what year. What do you say to American companies that are doing business there? Do they need to get out? 
I, I think American companies need to look at what happened with the Europeans and Russia. What I said, I spoke to 400 CEOs last summer, and what I said is, if China pulls the rug out from under us tomorrow, will you be ready? Every company needs to have a plan B. And the way America needs to look at it is just from a national security right. lens. But is it Are a plan, we ready? Is it a plan B when something happens, or is it a plan B right this minute? Meaning, are you saying, if Tim Cook is watching right now, are you saying, Tim Cook and Apple, you need to actually withdraw from China, both for yourself and for the country? Is that what you're, is that what you're really saying? Well, let's, let's first talk about what Americans need to know. President Xi started a commission that he personally chairs that says any company that does business in China has to cooperate with the Chinese military. So look at our tech companies. Look at all of our financial data. Look at all of our health care data. Look at our children's lifestyle data. And now know the Chinese military has it. What I'm saying is we look at it through a national security lens. So when COVID happened, they wanted you to put on a mask. It was made in China. They wanted you to take a COVID test. It was made in China. You go to the drugstore and everything is made in China. Let's just say if China pulls the rug out from under us tomorrow, right. will we be ready? And for American companies, what they need to understand is this is no longer a competitor. This is an enemy. And they need to start looking at doing business with our friends, India, Australia, Japan, South Korea. Let's start doing more business with our friends and let's become less dependent on China. That's what India is doing. That's what Japan right. is but, doing. But so the going to a different economy. And we're going to be learning more about that uh, as we go. But clearly... We're, we're, we're learning that things can be done uh, from remote, remote locations. We're learning that technology can replace people even more than we thought. We're not going back to the same economy. We're, going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign. And so we'll import Chinese-based CBDC technology. So it's going to be CBDC in a box. Uh, provided to you by the People's Bank of China. But every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be a token on a blockchain, an entry on a ledger, permanent and immutable. We will have truth instead of trust, and we will save over $7 trillion a year. Six to eight percent of global GDP is wasted by the friction of the trust industry that's necessary when you have dual entry accounting. With triple entry accounting, which is what a blockchain is, mm -hmm. we get rid of all of that friction. It's a beautiful future. Like what you see in China and their social credit scoring systems, right? If we get identity wrong, you know, it could be a tool to enslave humanity. And if we get it right, it could be a tool to liberate humanity as an American, you know. Uh, uh, I'm obviously rooting for the, the one that's on the side of freedom. Bitcoin is an international asset. And also, I do believe the role of crypto is, um, it is, it, it, it's digitizing gold. I actually believe this technology is going to be very important. I am, I, you know, look at it. We have been part of the huge revolution in investing through ETFs. We believe that ETFs will be changing the whole way we invest. Many people still use it as a means, well, people are investing it f for indexing. No, the majority of people who are putting money in an index, in an ETFs are active investors that are buying exposure. The entire bond market is being transformed as we talk right now. I believe the next generation for markets, the next generation for securities will be, will be tokenization of securities. Um, we will, and if we can have that distributed ledger that we know every beneficial owner, every beneficial s seller, we all have our, our, our code right. of who's buying, who's selling, instantaneous settlement. And think about it, it changes the whole ecosystem. Crypto teacher and the New World Order book, plus the three kids' books, it's time to re educate. Also, Nuno Crypto's Coinbase, Bitchu, Binance. Do not forget book links and crypto links are in the description. The stock channel, guys. Don't forget to go like, subscribe, spread everywhere. 
You have your Kobo, your chip size, your banking, your gaming, while everybody's sitting at home, get on stocks, the Seaver, the biotech stocks, and while everybody's at home wishing, they were still getting that free money. What are they doing? Drinking and smoking weed. Don't forget about those stocks, and you have a wonderful day. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation to come. Steve Jobs. And guys, you know I truly believe in this. When you look at the New World Order, they're the storytellers. And that's the reason why I wrote my New World Order book. But guys, now it's time to change the current generation. And I wrote three kids books. You know I love the Trinity because I understand the power that's in it. So I have three books. We have an opportunity to change the generation, to educate, not just me, but I want to show you that I take action on a daily basis. And I want you to take action on a daily basis, whether it's your job, whether it's in your community. We have an opportunity right now to educate the masses. I posted this on my Twitter account. Please share. But this is a short clip of the three books. There's going to be a clothing line and action figure. Please get these books for your kids, nephews, cousins, friends. So therefore, we can start the re-education now. Because as we see, the fourth industrial revolution foundation is definitely here. Robots, algorithms, drones, taking humanity out the picture. We have to re-educate. But let's get into the video. Part 1. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Save the village. Part 2. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Save New York. Long COVID-33. Part 3. King Joshua and Grandma Tim. Goes to China. It's mandatory to get Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3 of this series. It's time to re-educate Generation Z.